and then I just my first question was am I going to die from this and he said well yes we're here with Andrew Scarborough today who is uh, an extraordinarily courageous young man who has deployed his technical knowledge to help with a very challenging health situation he's faced which will be fascinating to uh, all our viewers out there. So I'm delighted to meet you, Andrew. And Thank you. Um, same here. I guess probably we'll just start with maybe give a little background into the challenge you, you suddenly faced a couple of years back. Yeah, so uh, just over two and a half years ago, mm. I was studying uh, nutritional therapy. I was doing a master's at the, the University of Westminster. It's very interesting. I learned yeah. that in my uh, undergraduate, uh, I had learned a lot of false information, uh, which was kind of annoying at the time. I had a, a lecturer who was on a, a paleo diet, and I was particularly in interested in that at the time, uh, because my diet at the time was what we thought, you know, in that... Uh, Lower fat, maybe more, mm. more, yeah, lower fat and high carb, the good carbs. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, were you always diet so conscious? Very, yeah. yes. I was uh, working as a personal trainer for a few years as well. Mm. I was getting partial seizures, which I didn't know were partial seizures. I thought I was very fit and healthy, so. It was a shock to me to be experiencing these odd symptoms. I still put it down to just being too stressed or, you know, mm. modern lifestyle in London is very busy and uh, everyone was having this flu at the time. So I thought, well, this is nothing to worry about. Mm. Uh, when it did get to something, I, I thought, okay, maybe this is a bit more serious. So I went to my GP a few times he just said, yeah, you're probably just stressed. Uh, there's no you know, other reason why you could be getting these migraines. Just take these pills and you'll be fine. Uh, I carried on for a while. My migraines got worse and worse. Then in February 2013, mm -hmm. I suffered a very strange partial seizure where my speech completely went mid-sentence and I felt very dizzy, uh, very confused that I could think of words but nothing was physically coming out. Uh, I had a metallic taste in my tongue. Still I didn't put this down to having a partial seizure, I just thought it's this flu and I'm just too stressed, I need to just rest and then I seemed to improve a little bit. I carried on with these horrific migraines for uh, a couple of months until I was coming back from a heavy workout in the gym um, in April that year, so 2013. Uh, and I'd, the migraines were becoming like a crushing headache on the side of my head. I was experiencing the metallic taste. Um, I couldn't feel parts of my body. Uh, I was sitting on an extremely busy train in the rush hour mm -hmm. and I'd then, I then felt like I'd been hit very, very hard on the side of my head by a hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's Gosh. probably the worst pain that I've wow. ever experienced. Yeah. And uh, it yes. went completely unconscious okay. after making strange yelping noises that I couldn't control and my body was convulsing quite uh, violently mm. and suddenly I became conscious and I was on the complete other side of the train with someone talking to me and I couldn't talk back to him I didn't mm. wasn't aware of anything that was happening I'd suffered quite bad superficial injuries, I dislocated my shoulder, uh, my tongue looked like it had gone through a blender, so I had a, a massive uh, grandma seizure as well as the 
what I'd discovered was a brain hemorrhage um, mm. that I'd had on the train. So uh, next, all I remember is I had uh, paramedics rush me out in a in a stretcher, mm. and just uh, then I, after that, I was in hospital for uh, a week where I was just having grand mal seizures where prior to having them I would get the aura where I'd think well with the attention I was having with all these doctors around me looking very concerned before I had any of these seizures I was thinking this could be you know I might not wake up from this mm. it was a terrifying time my family were terrified as well they were in the, in, uh, next to me in the hospital bed uh, and I was misdiagnosed many times so initially I had a CT scan um, that showed uh, bl blood on the brain so it looked like kind of like a, an explosion in my brain where just um, mm. lots of very vascular lots of blood around mm. um, and then this big mass in the uh, left temporal lobe, well, between the speech and movement area, so between the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I was initially diagnosed with an arterial venous uh, malformation. Oh. And then they changed their mind and said, oh, well, maybe it's a, a cavernous hemangioma, which is, if they can, op it can be a, quite a benign condition. Mm. Uh, which is just a tangle of abnormal blood vessels. So I was constantly assured, you know, this isn't so serious and don't just relax. It, it, there was just so much blood on the scans that they couldn't properly diagnose what, what this thing actually was. And then a month later, um, because I was still experiencing these very bad seizures um, where I would just go unconscious every single time and uh, have all these injuries as a result so the bruising and um, so what happened after that is a month later I had an operation to remove what I thought was the cavernous hemangioma at the time mm. on the discharge notes that I saw it still said cavernous hemangioma so I thought oh, okay still. this is you know, not so bad. <laughs> mm. um, so I had my brain surgery to remove as much as possible. And it was only six weeks after my operation that my neurosurgeon phoned me at home to say that it he'd got it horribly wrong <laughs> and that um, I actually had a malignant brain tumor that was treat he, he put it he put it to me that it was uh, treatable but not curable mm. and what kind of tumor uh, is an anaplastic astrocytoma and he told me that he had to leave uh, he had to leave some disease in, on the motor cortex area of my brain because because if he tried to operate on it I would either be uh, paralyzed or I would be dead so, mm -hmm. so so it's probably good that he decided to leave that but I asked him the question if you'd known it was uh, a, a tumor rather than a cavernous mangioma at the start would you have had me have an awake operation to try and get more of it out and he said possibly mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't know um, so that kind of annoyed me a bit at the time um, and then I just my first question was yeah, am I going to die from this and he said well yes <laughs> you know uh, he, he, again, he, he said yes you're going to die he, well he this. said these these types of these an, anaplastic astrocytoma which is a grade 3 um, brain tumour can it can vary in prognosis so you can live up to two to five years or it can be up to 20 years but mm -hmm. with the type that I had which was very vascular mm. uh, also 
just it it didn't have any of the desired mutations uh, that would predict a lot a longer prognosis. Was it um, you know uh, staging? Was it metastatic? Every brain tumor, which is grade three and four, would be um, it, it, it infiltrates into healthy brain tissue. So you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the benign ones are typically ones where it's uh, well circumscribed, so mm. um, you can usually take all of them out. Not not always, but but grade three, even if all of it's been taken out, they invariably come back and they're extremely aggressive. So and they yeah. they always invade into healthy brain tissue, so you can't yeah. get at it. And as you say, very, very vascular as well. Very, yeah. Very so fed. I had everything that you, <laughs> you, you wouldn't that would suggest a, a, a poor prognosis, prognosis. for mm. uh, a grade three. So you were so angry. You were saying upset. Yeah. Scared. And, and I'd, I'd study the mutations and what they were talking about, mm. all the jargon, yeah. uh, because they're not used to patients who are informed who are asking them. Well, what does this actually mean for my if I if I decide to have treatment, yeah. and their idea was well, because you have all of the the wor- because you have the worst possible scenario, and because we think chemotherapy is likely to not have any effect on you, mm. let's try giving you chemotherapy over two years, you know, and just keep just hit it really hard. And give you chemotherapy and radiotherapy for the standard six and a half weeks, and then give you uh, high dose chemotherapy indefinitely, and see what happens. See if that makes any difference. So well, that's um, the only tool they have in the box, really. So let's yeah. just deploy it. And uh, unfortunately, with the blood-brain barrier, even if you were to, even if you were to have these beneficial mutations, and the, if you don't have these uh, deletions that I had in my genes that were tumor suppressor genes. Um, mm. So <laughs> it's like I was in the worst possible scenario for yeah. that. It could have been worse. It could have been a grade four, but I went ahead and had chemotherapy and radiotherapy for a while uh, until I studied a bit more and realized that there was no actual scientific basis behind having that treatment for how my tumour presented in the in the pathology report. So I decided to question my oncologist about the the treatment I was prescribed by him Um, and he confirmed that because I didn't have any of these gene mutations that would suggest that my tumour would be chemosensitive at all Mm. I decided to voluntarily stop my treatment before long before he had you know intended um, intended me to go on and arguably then you you avoided maybe further kind of stress in your system by doing so because I was already experiencing short term memory loss Mm. um, extreme fatigue to where I couldn't even stand up um, and I just felt horrible. Yeah. So, but, and I looked horrible. So. But that sounds dramatic hmm. to just say I don't want any treatment when this is the only option that was available. Yeah. Despite there not being evidence, because you know this is typically the case in a lot of um, cancer treatments. Hmm. Um, the the protocols don't have any basis, but yet um, there's a hunch that. Um, it might provide some benefit, as in your case. So I wonder what your physician had to say about it when you said I wanted to forego chemo mm. and radiation. Well, he he was very actually he was actually very understanding because he understood that the idea for me was to give me a, a few more weeks or or a couple of months mm. uh, as a as a best uh, outcome. Mm. And he understood that my quality of life might be very poor. Uh, if you have that kind of chemotherapy over time, you actually can develop leukemia, amongst many other 
problems. Um, I'm sure this short-term memory would have been gotten even worse. Um, yeah. And so. just, yeah, he confirmed all this to me, which I was just very surprised about. Um, yeah. Well, I suppose for, for him to, you had done independent research, being mm. knowledgeable and capable, I'd come back with a proposal to him that actually the science didn't justify the treatment. And uh, interestingly, he acknowledged and said, well, actually, yep. yeah, but that's all we got kind of thing. Mm. He but even acknowledged that the temozolomide that I was on can actually cause further mutations and it, you can actually get um, a, a pseudo-response. So there's always this term of uh, a pseudo-progression which is, is like a, a standard, what's always discussed, but what's never really discussed with brain cancer in particular is a pseudo response where the treatment looks like it's working. So you do get this, it looks like a remission on a scan, yeah. but then what typically tends to happen, especially if you have something like Avastin, which I don't know if you know much about that, but typically that's a drug where it, it has this pseudo response where it looks like, oh, there's, you know, it's stopping blood supply to the tumour and it's fantastic because the tumour looks like it's shrinking but then actually it spreads into the brain very quickly and it's actually the treatment that ends up killing the patient more uh, earlier than the, the, the cancer would, which is... Yeah. I'm not a fan of Avastin. Yeah. Uh, so slightly so replacing with a slightly different mechanism, which is detrimental in other ways. Yeah, definitely. But then you, obviously, when you decided, with the agreement of your specialist yeah, to stop... Yeah, to my surprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you then now have to go and find another kind of science, mm. another strategy. Yeah. And that's what I think people will be fascinated to how you deployed your previous knowledge, mm. your new knowledge, and, and what you did. Yeah. So my first approach was to look at what I learned in my Masters in Nutritional Therapy. So prior to diagnosis, I'd learned about the ketogenic diets as a long studied approach for, in clinical settings, for drug resistant epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And because I had epilepsy as a result of my brain tumor, which isn't uncommon, um, I decided to look into that. And then I also, studied previously that it could be a potential management strategy for uh, um, for brain cancer in particular mm. uh, amongst other cancers but in particular the brain was found to be potentially more responsive to this kind of treatment especially if the tumor was uh, glowing so on, on my MRI scan it was um, it's usually PET scans where they PET scan, the uh, look, look at that, but you can see it on an MRI scan as well. You're suggesting when it so, lights up bright, it might be more metabolically active? Yes, okay. and I, I, um, I got that idea from uh, Professor Dominic D'Agostino. Um, uh, excellent. Uh, D'Agostino, yeah, yes. I, I was yeah. chatting to him about, well, what do you think of this... Uh, my MRI images. And Why he, did you contact him? What, what uh, is his um, area of expertise? Well, I, I learned about his research when I was doing my Masters in Nutritional Therapy. And then the first thing I did when I was diagnosed and my, I realized my treatment would have no effect on me and was actually showing more enhancement on scans, which suggested mm. that my cancer was actually coming back with treatment, mm. uh, which mm. is one of my reasons for stopping for all my treatment. Mm. Uh, I instantly contacted um, Dominic D'Agostino, I, I, I contacted uh, Thomas Seyfried because I'd looked at studies that they'd done together and I was very interested in how, uh, in, in the metabolic theory of cancer, mm. uh, just from and also fasting, just from the things I'd read, and I thought, well, I'm, I've got nothing to lose, and I'm having, I'm still having seizures, these horrible seizures all the time, where I can't even leave the house, and I can't even stand up without feeling like I'm going to collapse, and mm. uh, so I thought, oh, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to try and try my best at this approach, and 
I contacted long-term survivors as well to see what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at Ben Williams, who had uh, glioblastoma in 1995, inoperable in the middle of his brain, I think it was. And he'd done, uh, he had a drug cocktail approach, which was targeting the same signaling pathways as a restricted ketogenic diet with therapeutic fasting would and I found that very interesting so there were these two different approaches and I thought well you can either combine these two approaches or potentially try and mimic the the, the drug approach that targets these specific signaling pathways in natural ways with supplementation and diet and fasting and I found that just an area I really wanted to explore myself and I couldn't find much data on human studies but I did find things like Keto Pet which is the uh, <laughs> Keto Pet yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I wish we had it here because we're a country of animal lovers and yeah. Yeah. we just put our animals down when they have cancer but uh, I was fascinated by following these dogs online <laughs> seeing their scans and seeing the type of ketogenic diet that they were on and the combination of that with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy that they were having. Yeah. Who's uh, doing those? Um, well, it's, I think it's uh, Quest Nutrition in the US who are actually funding this, this amazing work that's mm, happening. Wow. And it's just great because uh, we, can learn a lot, we can actually learn a lot more from dogs with brain tumors than we can with implanted tumors that are put into into nice. rodents yeah. because dogs actually get more i didn't know this initially but dogs get more brain tumors than humans and i was thinking why is this mate is it the the human kind of pet food that we give them that have all these mm. ingredients that you know they're carnivorous animals and we're putting all these vegetables and these and grains. The grains. corn and corn yeah. and grains and all these unnatural ingredients into their food and I was just thinking about well I think I just think you can learn a lot more from these dogs than you can you can learn a lot from yeah. these rodents um, and I have done but um, I think though Andrew what you you basically were doing is you're triangulating between all different areas of study yeah different species and to be quite honest in my opinion making all the correct connections <laughs> And we'll get to that shortly, how effective mm. your research has been. I think Dominic D'Agostino, as well as done rodent studies with the combination of the ketogenic and the hyperbaric. Yes. And they're quite traumatic, the results. Uh, and also the combination of that with uh, ketonesters. Yeah. And that actually shows the disease has completely gone. So yeah, extraordinary. With the, with the control mouse that they had, which yeah. showed just metastatic cancer everywhere. Um, so that was an animal model. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that was nice. yeah. animal yeah. model. Yeah. Um, it was just very interesting to see the effect of, compared to the control of the ketogenic diet alone, yeah. and then the ketogenic diet plus hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which had an even greater response, mm -hmm. and then the ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and the keto nester, which had a symbiotic effect of just showing no cancer on the yeah. on the imaging yeah. uh, which just Powerful. fascinated me and mm. I thought well more humans need to be doing this and absolutely now unfortunately the revenue potential of those approaches is limited and that's mm. partly not to get into conspiracy <laughs> but without a massive revenue payoff there is there is very little interest mm. uh, but that particular study I mean they had the scans of representative mice um, uh, with dramatic metastatic cancer yeah everyone you could see as they added the different kind of synergistic components it turned mm -hmm. out the mice were dramatically different i mean some yeah. of them no measurable it was one of the most dramatic mice experiments i've ever seen yeah. it almost looked like someone staged it it was it was <laughs> extraordinary but sorry i, I digress so no, you that's fine, yeah. you moved forward with these studies this mm. triangulation What I did is I, well, I, I found this organization called Matthew's Friends, which initially they treated 
children with drug-resistant epilepsy with ketogenic diets. And they're, they're the UK version of the Charlie Foundation in the US. So it's very interesting how they're looking at this research and they're noticing how it's not just beneficial for epilepsy, this, this kind of approach. It's that they're, they're now treating more and more uh, brain cancer patients. And part of the reason they're allowed to do it with these patients with brain cancer is because in a kind of fortunate way, a lot of, a lot of patients with brain cancer present with epilepsy. So it provides this, it provides this way of going around, you know, mm. saying we're treating the cancer. It's like a back door. Uh, it, it's mm. a clever way yeah. of doing mm. it, yeah. It's just, it's, all, the, all these things are usually accidental um, mm. findings. And some, some of the things that I've experimented on myself have been accidental findings. Uh, just from having, from having my epilepsy, I see it as, as a, a strange, a strange kind of blessing because I know I can tell instantly. I get feedback instantly on what's helping my brain and what isn't. Yeah. So I've done a number of experiments. When I when I went on a traditional ketogenic diet, which is the translated form for children with epilepsy, trying to apply that as an adult with brain cancer, I actually failed miserably. And I suffered with uh, I, my my readings on my um, I was I was using a glucometer and my blood glucose and blood ketone readings were fantastic. So mm. I was ap applying that to the glucose ketone index, which is Thomas Seafried's kind of therapeutic ketogenic mm. method for uh, cancer patients to to follow to see how to manage to effectively manage um the growth of the cancer so you can at least slow it down mm. i thought that i w i looked at these human studies and i thought well i think i can improve this i, th I think there's there's more scope to improve this diet so what I did is I looked at the animal studies and I thought well the animal studies have much better success and I'm looking at these dogs and they're having much better success than the human models and I'm thinking well I know it's easier to control the dog's diet and their lifestyle mm -hmm. and I was I was thinking about the home all the hallmarks of cancer so I was thinking of systemic inflammation I was thinking of why I was getting these migraines on this ketogenic diet where I was getting these fantastic numbers on my blood ketones and uh, blood glucose which was suggesting to me mm. it should be successful but I was getting um, uh, the doctors were saying you have all the symptoms of temporal arteritis which is very unusual it's usually these really old men who get this uh, mm. Mm. and I was thinking well I, I clearly have this inflammation even though I should be, a ketogenic diet should be anti-inflammatory yes. what's what's going on how old are you so uh, I was 27 when I was diagnosed, okay. and now I'm 30, so okay. yeah. it's my birthday in September, <laughs> so not yeah. quite recent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just thinking, mm. surely you can improve this mm. and make it more, more specialised for treating the, all, all of the hallmarks of cancer, so not just the fact that it uses um, glucose as the main fuel source, particularly mm. if you have tumor that lights up um, but also we do know that glutamine is another source of fuel that the mm. these cancerous cells can mm. use quite readily that's a protein yeah so that's uh, an amino acid which is actually one of the essential ones so it's kind of yeah. a difficult area mm. but there are ways you can manipulate that so I restrict protein um, and when I, when I noticed that my diet was failing and I nearly went blind with this temporal arteritis, um, it got quite serious and I was prescribed prednisolone um, and told I should definitely take this or, you know, I'm likely to lose my vision. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is quite Was there serious. a reason that um, you surmised that you develop the temporal arteritis? Well, I put it down to the fact that 
I clearly had, at the time I, w I was taking a, a symptom diary and I was noticing that certain standard ketogenic foods were actually triggering these horrific migraines mm. and I thought, well, I, ha mm. I want to keep on this, I don't want to give up this diet because it's, these are surely essential ketogenic foods that you have to have, so the coconut oil, the avocados. Mm. But one thing that I'd studied is that when I when I looked into this in more detail, is that when you have a brain injury in that part of your brain, you can actually get, uh, you can actually be more sensitive to salicylates, uh, which is it's kind of like a animals have a fight or flight response uh, yeah. when they get stressed and. Um, and, and plants have a, a kind of a similar mechanism where they, they, uh, they're they high in salicylates so that you don't eat too many of them, uh, yeah. which I found, I didn't realize that at the time, so I found mm. it really interesting when I studied yeah. it. And I just thought, well, I'll cut out the foods highest in salicylates and see what happens. And I will, I'll try and have a, a more preferable omega-3 to 6 ratio in my diet because the traditional ketogenic diet that I was on was very high in salicylates and it was very high in omega-6 fatty acids because oh. of the nuts. Um, I, was, I also found I was sensitive to dairy so typically the diets that they prescribe for children with epilepsy that they try to prescribe to these cancer patients it still has a lot of dairy, so cheese, uh, double cream, mm. which in America is heavy cream. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, and omega six. All, all these nuts, yeah. um, and also these types of these types of omega three that are very poorly translated into DHA, which your brain needs. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll optimize the diet. I'll cut out nuts, I'll cut out dairy, I'll cut out these high salicylate foods and instantly my headaches disappeared, I had a lot more energy, my seizure activity was controlled much better, mm. I was more encouraged to produce my medication for the epilepsy which I was on an enormous amount, uh, the, about the highest dose you could be on of uh, levetiracetam and sodium valparate which is epilim. Um, so Kepra and Epilim, huge, huge doses, which give me horrible side effects. Uh, so over time, I just adapted the diet more and more. I was looking at ancestral diets and thinking, if I'm cutting out all these fruits and vegetables, um, and initially over time, I cut out all fruit and veg, which it might not be, might not work for everyone, but for me, had an instant response where it was beneficial mm -hmm. but I didn't want to be micronutrient deficient so I focused on changing what I was eating to having organ meats it, it made perfect sense when I looked at it and when I looked at the nutrition of things like eating things I eat now which is things like brain and I eat, so I eat head to toe of the animal I eat brain uh, sweet breads which actually is the best food for raising my ketones in my blood. And I've done experiments where I've tested the, the uh, myoglobin of the, of the fresh sweetbreads that I get from my butcher from grass-fed animals. And if you test it on a, using a, keto, a ketone strip, mm. using the, the glucometer, it actually always registers high, a, high, a very high reading. So that actually correlates with my postprandial uh, blood ketones and blood glucose after I consume the sweetbreads. Mm -hmm. I, I get, um, my blood glucose is actually the same as before I ate the food, an yeah. hour after eating it. Sometimes yeah. it's actually a bit lower, which is just, I found wow. that incredible. Amazing, and yeah. my blood ketones shoot up mm. very high. Um, yeah. And just uh, so eating all these organ meats, I was getting a vast array of nutrients that I then discovered 
was not only having benefits on my epilepsy and my general health, um, but was also, I have a number of blood tests uh, that my GP now organizes for me, who's hesitant to it first. Mm -hmm. um, and my health now internally is actually much better than before I was diagnosed with cancer. And I'm off all of my medication for epilepsy against medical advice. Mm. And my, I've achieved complete remission from my tumor. And what? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yeah, on, on scans I've achieved complete remission, which wow. isn't technically cure. We've got a new venue, we have to move venue. Um, so we we're just talking about having deployed the diet, and I know we'll get into more details of that quite shortly, uh, but having deployed it as you described it thus far, you know, what effect did you have? You dropped the medication, um, and, and how, are, how are things now, or how, how is your prognosis, etc.? Yeah, so since I made the changes to go on the Andrew ketogenic diet, <laughs> yeah. which is, uh, I haven't met anyone else who's doing this kind of ketogenic diet, so mm. I haven't got much data to go on. I had my last scan six months ago, which showed complete remission. Uh, wow. when, I, when I went in to see my oncologist to discuss the scan, he actually, the, the computer was in the corner, not facing me, mm. and the first thing he said was just, he wanted to talk about what I was doing, so he just said, well, what are you doing? Because <laughs> uh, this is really interesting. Mm. And what I have is, I have MRI spectroscopy, so it's using light to look at the microenvironment in my brain. And we notice that not only have I achieved this complete remission, which is not necessarily cure because it could come back, so I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, because yeah. uh, it's working. Um, that we can look at these, uh, we can look at these biomarkers to see potential for how the brain is changing while I'm on a ketogenic, a restricted ketogenic diet, uh, which is technically a, a zero carb ketogenic diet because mm -hmm. I don't eat the fruits and vegetables. You do get a certain amount of carbohydrate in eggs, steak, liver. Um, not so much in things like fish, which you just about none. Mm. Um, so my diet is very high in omega-3, uh, which would, uh, sources of omega-3 tend to have much less, even though it's neg negligible carbs anyway from these protein sources. Mm. Andrew, um, so... So we're looking at the biomarkers to see how that's changed. And interestingly, that's changed as well as my... Um, so the, the markers of potential tumour progression have changed as well as showing no enhancement on the scans, which is very interesting. He actually offered me uh, employment after speaking to me mm -hmm. to try and help other patients to go on ketogenic diets because often the, the, they're trying to find an optimal ketogenic diet for brain cancer patients because mm -hmm. there's lots of struggles with how do you deal with the epilepsy, how do you deal with just the stress of changing your whole lifestyle uh, mm. because it's not just about diet, it's about your whole lifestyle. I've made huge lifestyle changes as well as the diet, which I could talk all day about that, but um, mm. yeah, so that's what I... Andrew, I, I want to just back up for a second. So uh, what you know, what your doctor knows, how many patients have uh, decided not to seek um, standard therapy mm. for astrocytomas and um, have gone on to have a remission? At Charing Cross, none. And where, where I was at before, at the Royal Marsden, uh, every patient that I received my initial treatment passed away within a relatively short period of time, even with the pe people with um, less less aggressive brain cancers than myself. So uh, that's 
That is truly remarkable. It's telling. So, yeah. so at Charing Cross, uh, the the reason I moved from reason I moved from the Royal Marsden to Charing Cross Hospital, uh, it's worth saying that the Royal Marsden is very good for other cancers, but for brain cancer, they're lagging behind and their survival rates are not great. Uh, but where I am now, they're actually working with uh, Dr. Adrian Sheck at the the Barrow Neurological Institute in the US, mm. who's doing these ketogenic diet studies on, on the mice um, who are injected with the glioblastoma brain tumors. And they're collaborating together. And it, I don't think it's any coincidence how at uh, Charing Cross Hospital we have the, the longest survival rates for brain cancer in the entire country. Um, and they're the, the, the only ones that I know of that really are behind um, supporting uh, metabolic treatments for cancer management. But I don't know of anyone who's uh, completely gone off the standard treatment and, and done that. So yeah. they usually try and do it with standard treatment. And uh, yeah, it just occurs, or what would worry me is, so ketogenic diets, um, which for the benefit of people who aren't aware, they're extremely low carbohydrate and they switch your metabolism from more glucose based to using ketones for energy. And I think ketones have been shown in vitro, you know, to be anti-cancer and yep. obviously in vivo, there's emerging evidence. Um, but what's interesting is you've deployed a very specialized form of ketogenic diet and you've done it directly based on feedback from your own system mm -hmm. and you would have to presume that the, the huge success you've had is, is very much due to that and as you say you had the feedback you had the migraines as a as a measure of, of efficacy um, but your diet which was tailored and perhaps extremely effective is not the one they're generally using exactly so yeah there's huge potential to deploy your knowledge I believe so yeah. yeah I believe that the standard ketogenic diets that are, we're applying to humans are too high in omega-6 fatty acids they have too many things like nuts um, in my opinion too much even uh, too, too much coconut oil because that is even though it has tremendous benefits in raising ketones and it has these antimicrobial properties I don't think people should be consuming them to such a high level that they are because it, mm. it just mm. goes together with you know not having what I would consider is an optimal level unless they're also eating most of their calories from lots of oily fish and which I don't think they are but um, mm. also the dairy with um, there, there's controver controversy about dairy and, and cancer in terms of ketogenic diets as a management strategy but personally I believe that it's beneficial to cut out dairy so instead uh, I find also in terms of how insulogenic um, yeah. dairy products are if you compare ghee to butter uh, when I was consuming butter I found that when I switched to ghee I had much a much improved uh, much improved blood glucose readings where they were significantly lower mm. just from that change alone even yeah. with the exact same macronutrient ratios and same foods a lot alongside that because I'm very every meal that I have is weighed and structured to the exact gram and every food is it's just proportioned to my exact needs and that's through a trial and error process and also just from comparing my diet to the animal studies which I try to actually I try to copy them but adapt it to my yeah. own uh, to my own needs so. and when we talk about and you're mentioning many elements of your diet there earlier we mentioned sweetbreads and people may not be familiar with the term but it means the pancreas thymus and the glands mm. uh, certainly nothing to do with bread or <laughs> or wheat full of electins and yeah. other poisons um, good to make that distinction yeah i think so <laughs> um but so organ meats is a pretty heavy uh, part of the diet obviously for me yes yeah uh, from from what i know about studying traditional cultures so uh, a lot of my research was from uh, 
they, they were actually here at the in this paleo conference, the Western A Price. Um, oh, great foundation, yeah. Foundation. Yeah. And oh. uh, just studying the research from that, just yeah. I, I gained a lot of uh, insight from learning about the, the health effects that you could gain from from the knowledge that we seem to have abandoned uh, particularly yeah. when people talk about paleo um, people are still quite hesitant to include the organ meats and uh, mm. other things that I do as well so well, well Andrew I, I sense a little hesitation to talk about all the various foods <laughs> that you eat mm. and this would really be a great opportunity to just tell everybody about the uh, interesting foods that you have okay, yeah. uh, chosen to eat to uh, address the, your condition. Mm. Well, my whole thing is that I think to gain the full health benefits if you're eating animal products is to eat the whole animal. So mm. I consume a lot of organ meats, as I said, so consume the whole animal. I also eat lots of eggs where essentially you are. The, the, the reason they're so beneficial nutritionally is because you're eating the whole animal. So, because <laughs> it's an egg. They're essentially a whole animal yet to be. Yeah. 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 And one, yeah. one of the things I do is I also am into entomophagy. So I eat mm. insects as well. And yeah. that's, that's to get nutrients that I might be missing from, um, from if I was to eat various vegetables and fruits and if I was to have nuts so it's kind of like my it's kind of like my um, replacement for nuts um, so I get the magnesium I get um, just a vast array of nutrients because with insects you're eating the whole animal and I don't get them online which uh, that's the ones that are designed for human consumption in the west it's a yeah. growing trend so I what I do is I actually uh, I get my own insects from pet shops uh, which are actually ironically treated much better than the ones that were uh, designed for human consumption in in developed countries which is quite ironic mm -hmm. and I I often breed them myself and then I just stick them in the freezer to make mm -hmm. sure they're they're killed off and also because they don't feel pain and I like to be morally oh. a, a good person. Um, nice. <laughs> I, I, I feel good that even though I form an attachment to them when, when they're growing mm. and developing, uh, I, I'm fine with fr freezing them to kill them mm. and before I wash them and, and eat them. I either eat them raw or I, because the freezing kills off any bacteria that might be there, any mm. pathogens. And then I will uh, either fry them gently, and then just eat them. So I, yeah. I find that it does, I eat, I eat the fatty insects. So that goes with my ketogenic diet, yes. and I find it just I, I enjoy yeah. it. Gives yeah, me a nice variety I'm... in my diet. I can also make breads with with the insect flowers. So I make my own flowers, uh, which much much tastier than the insect flowers that you can get from these massive companies and mm. and people might be aware yeah that this insect flower and insects are becoming more mainstream mm. beyond even what you're specializing in yeah. getting nutrients um, but I've, I've seen documentaries also where cultures in, in other lands when certain insects come in and swarms the whole the whole tribes gather them in huge baskets and it's a mm. celebration time and they have weeks and weeks of cakes made <laughs> in insects so for people who think this is unusual there's not human cultures there's a huge history there yeah and it's probably a very today. valuable one insects right. yeah. are, are eaten, eaten everywhere in the world exactly. oh yeah yeah, yeah in exactly. many countries it's their main protein source yeah. Yeah. and we don't realize that um, well we have this myth where we think that oh they just eat those they just eat those foods because they don't have any money and they don't have access mm. to you know all these other other sources of protein but in, in actuality in many cases they found that even if they do have access to other sources of protein they, pref they actually prefer the insects so yeah. it's uh, it's just a cultural 
thing that we that we don't uh, we don't follow, which right. you know there's millions of people around the world that do. So. Yeah. And then you said there's another organ meat that you consume. Uh, you yeah. have dabbled in brain. Have brain. You? Yeah. Well, I've yes. eaten everything, everything that you could yes. eat. So I've had brain. I've had brain. I've had well. The main reason I started to eat brains is because I know that my brain is and everyone's brain really mm. is uh it's, it's about 80 percent fat mm. and it, it most the rest is mostly water um as well as that we have um 20 percent of that fat is dha which we know uh specifically if you have brain cancer if you look at the micro environment in that area of the brain where the cancer is levels of dha are just rock bottom Mm. There's just there's hardly any there, and same with magnesium. So I supplement with um, magnesium chloride, which actually because I get auras before I have seizures, I've actually experimented where I've experienced auras, and then I've taken a few sprays of a magnesium chloride solution, and it's actually reversed the seizure, and I know that from from my studies that with anyone with epilepsy, whatever the cause, you have uh, very, very low levels of magnesium mm. um, before a seizure happens. And one of the ironic things about medication for epilepsy is that it actually causes magnesium deficiency as well as calcium deficiency, mm. uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, and all of these things, if you have optimal levels, actually can prevent you from having seizures so it's quite ironic so what a neurologist will do if someone is having more seizures if they've if they're on a lot of medication for epilepsy is they'll just increase the dosage rather than mm. think about a nutritional strategy and sure. and take these in, things right. into account so, uh, so. Uh, do you worry about uh, infection if you're consuming brain the prions? Well, recently I stopped, even though the risk is very low of infection, mm. um, I was concerned about having scrapie because my, my preferred source is, is lamb, so I'll get a whole, a whole lamb and eat the, from head to toe, which lasts a long time, eat the mm. whole animal. Um, but I was very concerned about, um, about scrapie, even though the risk is very low, so I've stopped eating those, unfortunately, but I still eat the, the sweet breads, which I find extremely beneficial for my type of ketogenic diet. Mm. And, and which were a delicacy for, for many, many centuries. But mm. nowadays, sadly, in general, people have moved away from all these real ancestral foods that were part of our evolution yeah. and, and are eating kind of false foods, really. Mm. I, I love foods. organ meat and I yeah. love thymus and liver and kidney. And yeah. pate is one way for people who, who don't quite like, say, liver. You yeah. know, pate can be a great way. And I think the lady from Weston Price said that and <laughs> she was in France. Mm. By eating pate, she realized, even though she didn't really like liver, she could get a lot of this nutrient. Yeah. And it so. just, it's like a multivitamin. It has oh. everything in it. Um, so, yeah, I would thoroughly recommend it. It's so good for the immune system. All the vitamin A as well. If you have that um, that amount of vitamin A from plants, it's toxic. So yeah. with animals, it's completely different. Unless you consume the liver of a polar bear, of course, but um, <laughs> which we don't really have much of. But uh, mm. if you're starting to eat organ meats, I, I would start with heart, because um, people don't know this, but heart is actually well, a lot of people don't know it, but mm. heart would be the very best source of coenzyme Q10. Uh, which, uh, if you have any kind of inflammatory disease, um, it, it's 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 a brilliant thing t to consume uh, for various reasons. Um, but also, it, it's it's that thing as well. Of if you eat heart, it's good for your heart, um, just nutritionally, and it's cost effective as well. So, heart is. It cost me about 60p to get a, a grass-fed uh, 250 gram mm. lamb heart. Whereas mm. if you were to get um, 
a, 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 say a, a ribeye steak of yeah. e equal quality it would be about 10 times the amount in price you know I'm amazed, yeah. uh, so but the quality is the same the nutrition is maybe even superior and you're paying next to nothing so mm -hmm. my weekly shop is very cheap <laughs> and, and that is an irony that you are getting a specialized i was going to say diet but in a sense it's a form of medication arguably even mm. more effective than current medications but it's rock bottom price because the human population have generally walked away from these ancestral foods yeah. leaving them at a rock bottom price so you can eat an incredibly nutritious diet for next to for next to nothing exactly it's ironic so uh, yeah. So probably beyond then, there's the whole organ meat thing, which I know people don't eat nowadays, but certainly people who have particular challenges would be mm. very fascinated by this. So moving beyond the organ meats then, um, the omega-3 then, your high omega-3, low omega-6, how do you... Yeah, uh, so I try to keep uh, as close to a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 to 6 as possible. And in London, we have a place called the um, Nutri Centre, mm. which is just opposite Regent's Park, and they have an actual kit that you can test your own omega-3 to 6 uh, ratio okay. in your blood. Yeah. And it's it's a fantastic test. You just put your blood on a, a two markers, and they will, you send it off free post. Uh, they, they give you all the details you need to fill in, and you get your results a week later, and it's very interesting. They give you a whole report on uh, what your ratio is, how, why it's important, the research behind it, how you can improve. And I found that very beneficial. Mm. I've noticed changes as my, as I, as I've gotten to a more preferential reading. Yeah. And also just with other things I've done, like the magnesium. If we look at how. There's a current trend at the moment which I'm a bit sceptical of. There's some things where I can see some merit in, um, mm. where we're repurposing drugs for diabetes uh, for cancer management, and it's, it's using drugs that target the same signaling pathways as my restricted ketogenic diet does. But I'm sceptical of the long-term effects of these drugs, particularly the statins, for cancer management. But I am, yeah, I'm just thinking that, we're thinking about statins. We know that magnesium uh, can act as, an, as a natural statin. Yeah. So it, that, what that's doing is, it's allowing your body to control your cholesterol nat in a natural way, rather than with these statins, what it's doing is it's actually completely wrecking that process mm. over time. So in the short term, we can see, uh, in the short term with these cancer patients, we do actually see some benefits, but I question the long-term use of these mm. drugs. And I just think with all these things, surely we can have a natural way of doing them uh, with diet and lifestyle and well, good sleep as well, because one of the other things I did was to have uh, melatonin, which has significant anti-cancer um, benefits. So I was doing that for a while mm -hmm. and I was doing it uh, as a cycle because I didn't want my, uh, it's, it's a hormone that you know you produce to, to get, when you get drowsy and preferentially when it starts to get darker, you produce yeah. more. Um, so I was taking that for a while until my body actually got very used to it and then I was doing it as cycles and now I don't take it at all because I just have this sleep routine where I just instantly go to sleep when it, when, well, when it gets dark I produce a lot of melatonin now right. just naturally I don't know if that's to do with the diet I know a ketogenic diet can act, if it's structured properly can help you to sleep better Mm. Um, some people report less sleep, but um, I don't know why that would be. Mm. But for me personally, I find that, yeah. And, and, and the whole sleep thing is related to insulin and so many different yeah, things. And massive. we can also talk about vitamin D. When I was diagnosed, uh, my levels of 
vitamin D were in the severely deficient range. So uh, it was in the 20s, low 20s. Um, that's nanomolars. Um, oh, yeah, so that would be maybe six or seven nanogram, which mm, is really low. Very low. And now it's, uh, last time I checked, it was 200. So mm. <laughs> yeah, pretty, a, a significant difference. So what I did was I supplemented with uh, a liquid form of vitamin D3 because I don't like taking tablets because of the um, the fillers that they use. No. It doesn't wreck my blood glucose readings. Also with my vitamin D3 I take uh, K2 because yeah, it works together okay. and that's very important for people to understand because lots of times people just take vitamin D3 and think mm. that's all I need to do but you need to think about the interactions. Yes. Yeah. For sure. And interestingly, as you list out these things, so a, a very high fat, a high omega-3 versus omega-6. And I know you say one to one, but mm. that's a very high omega-3 to omega-6 because yeah. in Western society now they can be 30 to 40 to one, mm. six to three. Yeah, the standard is, is about 40 to one in favor yeah. of omega-6, which is... It's just, it's it's basically a raised middle finger to ancestral heritage yeah. this way i often <laughs> sometimes my diet's even in favor of omega-3 so it can even be yeah. two to one or three to one in in favor of the yeah. omega-3 fatty acids which is very uh different to what's yeah. standard even if people are trying to yeah. maintain that balance so. And if you take then the high fat, I magnesium is another key one. I, there's estimates of 70, 80 mm percent -hmm. of people now are essentially magnesium deficient, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to measure. It's sequestered in our bone and it's yeah. not just a simple blood test. And if we think mm -hmm. about how much calcium we have in our diets, not just from the food we eat, but also from water, we have mm -hmm. so much calcium in, in the water that we need to balance that out by, mm -hmm. you, you need at least a, a two to one ratio of, you know, uh, in favor of magnesium to, to the calcium content. And a lot of people don't realize this, it's, it's essential. So we need to look at our water as well as what we eat. And mm, for sure, and yeah, magnesium, absolutely essential in all those biochemical reactions mm -hmm. with, with calcium. But if you, you take high fat, you take the omega-3, omega-6, the magnesium, the K2, yeah. um, and we've also mentioned, or you mentioned vitamin D, and ideally through healthy sunlight. Ideally, But, but yeah. this list are actually part of your specialized targeted diet, uh, and yet it's also the list that from a paleo sense, everyone should be having for prevention of disease and for, for avoidance of chronic disease. Yeah. So I, I, I love the way that the two are lining up. You're going further, but you're really targeting. You're I'm, highly... I'm going full paleo. <laughs> you're going beyond. I don't go yeah. half, so I, I go yeah. full. Yeah. So, so, Andrew, yeah. I would like to call this the Andrew Protocol. <laughs> yes. like, like the world's protocol. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and it's you're fantastic. brilliant. You're well studied. And my question is, it would be such a challenge for other people to adhere to something mm. like this, what would you recommend? Well, I find it a challenge myself. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's difficult to get medical professionals to mm. offer you any support in this area. Um, when I was cutting out the fruits and vegetables, I was told, you know, that's not, mm. they wouldn't, rec no one would recommend it. Even dietitians who were supporting the ketogenic diet were saying, well, I wouldn't recommend that. And I just think that it's good to get information together to show to medical professionals to say, well, look, you know, um, this, this actually has some merit and mm -hmm. y y it can be done and it can be, it can be an approach which is not dangerous and is, if it's well structured, um, I would actually, I would actually ask people to contact the Western A Price Foundation and find out more about um, ancestral diets and just just read a lot more about mm. uh, real paleo diets as well as you know. You know the bars. It, it's it's kind of a, an area where there's lots of different opinions and people mm. say what works for you works for you, so it's just yeah, a trial and error process where. 
I think monitoring is very important. I'm very into testing, so um, the good thing about Matthew's friends who I approached is, uh, and the Charlie Foundation do as well, is they will encourage you to have these blood tests, so these range of tests, mm. to see just how you're doing and how you can monitor your progression, and mm. that's essential as well. So uh, there's so many things you could do. It, but if people have any questions, they can contact me. I'm happy to do that. I get literally hundreds of emails a day about it, but yeah. I'm always happy to help others. So Excellent. I think it's very important. Yeah, I think what you've done, though, by being so scientific, knowledgeable, structured, and, and working based on responses in a very scientific way, mm. you've, you've reached a point that vast majority of people might not be able to get to so that knowledge is so valuable because it's relatively rare and especially as you say in the medical profession nutritional approaches are largely way behind pharmaceutical yeah. ones one of the uh, main problems is that when medical professionals are studying they don't really go over nutrition much they just skim over it and it's all about drugs um, mm. drugs are always the magic bullet um, even trying to make ketogenic diets into pill form now uh, for patients with epilepsy and it's just I think there's just better ways of doing it mm. um, and with the support it can be frustrating so ideally you would do a ketogenic diet for cancer management alongside hyperbaric oxygen therapy especially if you're in a, a polluted environment like uh, we have in London I think everyone could benefit from this hyperbaric oxygen therapy and my uh, aunt who has MS can actually have it uh, readily available for her for her condition but I can't have it myself I would have to the NHS won't provide that for me so I would have to have that myself even though a brain tumor is a traumatic brain injury and people with traumatic brain injury so people who uh, come back from the army and they've had a, any kind of brain injury mm. can instantly get access to hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the results are just astounding in their healing yes, so I heard. Um, if uh, I have to have that access through a fantastic charity called yes to life which hardly anyone knows about they're a very small charity and they actually most of the money they get actually comes from patients who have cancer in their families rather than anyone else because no one really knows about them. Mm. But they provide nutritional advice, which is all based on peer-reviewed uh, studies. Mm. And they offer, they can offer help with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I'm about to receive finally, which is fantastic. Um, so that would be amazing to see the effect on my scar yeah. tissue. I've just got that little bit which I'm working on. It's kind of like a bodybuilder where you have these, you know, these bits that you want to focus on in every scan. I think, okay, well, I've got this little bit that I need to optimize and work on. And how do I do that? So the hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a huge part yeah. of that. And um, I'm very keen to explore that. You're sculpting, I think. I'm sculpting my brain. They yeah. use. Yes, <laughs> excellent. And of course, we'll put with this video, I mean, uh, we'll put links to some of the key papers and other mm. links and contact details, particularly the mouse study we mentioned where we had the ketogenic, ketogenic plus isobaric and the ketogenic isobaric plus. Plus the ketonester. Ketonester, well, yes. And some of your scans. Results. Yep. Oh, yes, yeah, and your images, own scans. Yeah. And the keto pet was the dogs. So yeah. Uh, that, uh, that I was not aware of, that whole, um, and not only the research around dogs, because most of the ones I've seen are rodent studies, mm -hmm. but, um, but also that interesting observation that the dogs are more and more getting brain cancers, yep. and we're, I mean, we're feeding them, whatever about humans, we're feeding them certainly not their ancestral diet, we're feeding them loads of grains and yeah, there's, nuggets. Yeah, there's even some companies that are producing oh, uh, a vegan... Vegan oh. pet, vegan dog food, and vegan cat food. 
Oh. And these these animals are carnivores, you know. Oh gosh! Uh, I think once just, you've reached that, uh, they, they become diseased very quickly when you do that. So they uh, do and overweight, and it, yeah, that that is. Uh, the lunacy has reached new levels when, when we have that for sure. <laughs> Definitely. So, um, are there any other aspects then? Maybe on we well, we probably covered most of the key interesting mm. aspects of the diet. And again, there'd be more material to be able to, you know, go through more detailed offline. But are there any other uh, elements of diet to add? I guess we've probably covered the core. Mm. The, the main things, I would say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to cover. So. Yeah. Excellent. Have you any further questions, Jeff, for this no, particular session? No, it's just a pleasure to meet you and get to know you. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to be at an event like this and meet mm. people who I admire for what they're doing and, mm. uh, you know, mm. people like yourself and, and Iva. And um, just knowing, um, having met all these fantastic people who are enabling me to do what I'm doing is... Uh, giving me that knowledge and that empowerment is hugely beneficial and um, I've got my next MRI scan tomorrow and I'm very confident about it so you'll share that with us I will I would do Excellent. Excellent. and uh, it's MRI right. spectroscopy so I can talk a bit about that as well and uh, just show you the data it's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating stuff it is indeed and I share the fascination but obviously so much more personal to you well I only met Andrew yesterday for the first time briefly I immediately knew that we had to have this discussion on camera because <laughs> the huge benefits uh, for other people who are, who are similarly afflicted and I'm uh, delighted to meet you Andrew and uh, you. hope to meet you again very soon yeah thanks very much okay pleasure thanks, thanks. <laughs>